I know you're not supposed to hate anyone, but I hate what he done to me. When Nancy Womack was 16, she lived at an orphanage in Dalton, Georgia. Nancy fell in love, but when the orphanage director learned Nancy was pregnant, he made a decision that would haunt her for the next 40 years. He said, this is what's gonna happen. You're not shaming the children's home, and we're gonna take care of this. At three months pregnant, the director sent Nancy away to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and the Bethesda Home for Girls. And it was a long dirt road from the main road down to Bethesda. At the time, I thought it was the longest dirt road in the world. And then it opens up to this long, white building. It was like a nightmare. I was born in Dalton, Georgia. My grandparents raised me up until I was about nine or 10. They had got sick and the state had told her either she do something with us or the state would take us. They put us in the Dalton Rescue Mission. I had never heard of Bethesda until they sent my sister there. Just woke up one day and she's gone. And the director of the home had told me that that's what she wanted to do, that she would get more spirituality at this home in Bethesda. When I got pregnant, the house parent had found out I was, and he said, pack an overnight bag, you're going to see your sister. Halfway there, he told me what they were gonna be doing. They were taking me and leaving me there. The baby would be taken from me. We were on the interstate. I was gonna jump out, because I wanted this baby. I wanted her. <laughs> they took her from me. The Bethesda Home for Girls advertised itself as a place where troubled kids would learn discipline through the Word of God. According to Nancy and other women who lived there when they were young, days at Bethesda started early and consisted of praying, cleaning, and listening to the preaching of national evangelist and founder of the home, Lester Roloff. The state let her run her own institution, but let the church run it. They had us listening to audio tapes of Lester Roloff day in, day out. When you wasn't praying or listening to the preacher, you were cleaning. I seen one girl refuse. They drug her to the shower room, beat the holy daylights out of her. You just learn after a while, after being abused and slapped and, and hit and punched, I guess survival mode kicks in. That's the result of your television program. Say what you please. You can raise all the cane you want to raise. Just let me get through this day. Two weeks before she was due to give birth, Nancy was put on the first airplane she'd ever been on and flew to Tennessee to deliver her baby. I remember them putting the IV in me, and I remember I was falling asleep, and I'd pull it out, and they'd put it back in, and they'd just give me a shot and put me out. I don't remember having her. I don't remember them wheeling me into the delivery room. I don't remember nothing. Well, the next morning, the doctor, he come in, and I said, I want to see my little girl. And he said, how'd you know you had a little girl? You weren't supposed to know what you had. I never will forget that. I don't have the words to tell you what it feels like to have your baby stolen from you, to know that you want her, and for them to take it because they want the money off of it. There's no words for that. And there's always that hole. Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where Brother Roloff runs a home for unwed mothers, the district attorney has been looking into charges. He has been selling the girls' babies for hundreds of dollars. In 1974, five years before Nancy gave birth, homes run by the Lester Roloff Ministries in both Mississippi and Texas were coming under scrutiny by local authorities. Brother Roloff denied the charges. He says he doesn't profit from the babies. He merely tries to place them in good Christian homes. In fact, selling babies wasn't illegal in Mississippi and wouldn't be until 2009. Amid allegations of abuse, Roloff fought most of his legal battles in Texas over his refusal to follow state licensing requirements. During this time, he produced a documentary, Freedom's Last Call, to argue against the government's right to regulate religious homes it's an insult to God's work and God's people that support these homes to accuse us of doing irreparable damage to children when we make no charge and have done nothing but love them and lift them and teach them to sing the praises of God. 
Girls, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, we love Jesus. Roloff closed his facilities in Texas rather than submit to the state. But in Mississippi, where there were no regulations on religious homes, Bethesda stayed open. The law of the Lord, that's what we go by. Statutes, man-made, unscriptural, unconscious, they don't mean anything to me. Roloff died in a plane crash in 1982, but Bethesda remained operational through the mid-80s when a girl ran away from the facility. Youth court judge referee Dan Wise investigated and declared Bethesda an illegal jail. In 1986, the state took custody of the 117 girls who lived there. The home closed permanently a year later. We actually had to take over the home. The pastor abandoned the property. However, there were all kind of records at the court and they would bring the girls into Hattiesburg, they would be pregnant, and then they would move the girls out to another state to stay in a foster home and do the adoption in another jurisdiction. So there was no way to, to track them down. There were at least 100 adoptions in our county that I'm aware of. There's no way to know how many. If you could just say and spell your name. Okay, my name is Melanie Spencer. Can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Where did you grow up? Okay. Um, so I grew up mostly in Africa, in South Africa. My dad was a missionary. My parents have always told me that I was adopted. They said it was through a Christian adoption agency and that it had been important for my biological mother that I go into a good Christian home. I think a lot of times growing up, I didn't feel rooted or connected. Melanie Spencer had always been curious about her biological family. But when she got older and Tennessee passed a law opening adoption cases like hers, she was nervous. There were some cases that were being opened where maybe the mom didn't tell the family that there had been another child. The more I thought about, do I really want to disrupt her family or you know what she's done with her life moving forward, maybe I shouldn't dig into this anymore. I decided to walk away. In the years after the birth, Nancy tried to find her daughter. One lawyer told her she wasn't fit to be a mother. She also tried contacting child services. When I told them what happened, they didn't believe me. So I quit telling my story after that. Through the years, I remember thinking, well, she should be taking her first step now, or that her first day of school should have started. And every year on her birthday, I know it didn't make any sense, but I always baked her a cake. She would be 12 today. She would be 13 today. She would be 14 today. She was always there. So I had my son in 2014, and then I had my daughter in um, February of 2018. I really started thinking about what will I tell them about where they're from when they're older and they start asking questions. And so I decided to do Ancestry. The most interesting part was that it came up with a DNA match. I sort of looked at it and I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, what do I do with this? You know, I think I just decided to go for it. My name is Melanie Spencer, and I was born in June of 1979. I was adopted as a baby from Eastridge, Tennessee, and I know nothing about my family. My adoption was closed, but I think my mother's birth name was Nancy. Nancy's sister received Melanie's message. And on January 31st, she said, yes, I know the story. And she said, yes, I know the story. We need to talk. I think she said she was born in Eastridge on June the 14th, and I knew, I knew who she was. So I connected with Nancy through Facebook. I remembered looking at her picture and was like, wow. <laughs> there she is. Hello, Melanie. Hi. How are you? It's good to finally find you. I know this is scary. I have waited 39 years for this. I've wondered about you for a long time. It's a little overwhelming. There's not a day goes by that I have not thought of you. I want you to know that you are loved so much. 
I'll answer any question you have. Sometimes I wake up and I think, oh God, I'm just dreaming. Because I used to dream about meeting her. So yeah, this is like a dream to me. Oh God, I'm so nervous. I'm happy that she will know that she was loved. I'm happy that, that I finally found her, or she's found me. That's her. Hey, sis. How are you? Hi. God, I'm so glad you're here. The drive down, you know, I was kind of anxious, and then I got out of the car, and there she was. 42 years of questions. <laughs> It almost feels like there wasn't any missing time. It feels like coming home. She wanted to know about her siblings. She had always wanted brothers and sisters, and oh, she has a house full now. And she's just what I thought she would be. She's beautiful, she's smart. She just didn't realize how crazy I was until she, no. I guess she walked Stop into it. the house. Stop it. So I was very aware of Elvis being the number one man. <laughs> He's my happy place. Since connecting with Melanie, Nancy has shared her story with other women who lost their children at Bethesda. She hopes that finding Melanie inspires them to keep looking for their own children. Seven pounds, seven ounces. When I was in labor, you felt bigger than that. <laughs> First birthday, living in Indonesia. These girls on the Bethesda groups, they talk about forgiveness and healing. Then they say, let it go. I can't let it go. Yes, she's in my life, and yes, I get to spend a week with her. But so many things I've missed, I can't let that go. But maybe after this, it won't be so bad. They won't take no more from me. The Bethesda Home for Girls closed in 1987. But Roloff's teachings have continued to inspire homes for troubled teens. And of course, when we closed them, the people that operated the Hattiesburg home moved to the state of Missouri, which shamefully had almost no regulations on these kind of homes. And so that's still going on in Missouri to this day. The homes are no longer accused of selling babies, but allegations of abuse persist. They're all over the place, unfortunately. And with internet, they've actually gone international, but it's the same people, the same deal. Brother Roloff's photo is still hanging at the front door. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.